So next up, we have a presentation from Queensland Pacific Metals with the ticker code QPM, a company re-energizing Australia with critical minerals production. So to tell us more, today I am joined by Managing Director and CEO, Dr. Stephen Grokout. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present the QPM uh, Townsville Energy Chemicals Hub project. <clears throat> Here's a snapshot of uh, QPM. You can read this for yourself, but some key features include three of the biggest tier one lithium ion battery and electric vehicle manufacturers as significant shareholders, a comfortable cash position, and a share price with significant upside, as I'll demonstrate in the balance of this short presentation. First, uh, here's a one slide uh, summary of QPM. We are fully vertically integrated from ore supply, gas supply, battery materials production, and 100% offtake agreements. We have excess gas supply to our needs through our recent acquisition of the Murumba gas project, with that excess gas to be used for highly profitable peaking power generation through the 240 megawatt Townsville power station. We have almost negative 1 million tonnes of CO2 emissions reductions, and that's achieved through intercepting waste gas, especially methane from the northern Bowen Basin, and uh, capturing that before it hits the atmosphere. We have 2.1 million tonnes of ore supply through agreements with four of the leading miners in New Caledonia. That's more than the 1.6 million tonnes that we need for the tech project. All of the non-nickel, non-cobalt ore components end up as value-added byproducts. Even the small amount of leach residue displaces quarry sand as engineered construction fill. All tier one approvals are in place and the Queensland government has declared the tech project to be a project of state significance and also to be a significant investment project status. We have unsurpassable commercial security because we have 100% of the nickel and cobalt sulfate production committed in life of project binding offtake agreements with tier one customers who are also investors. All of this leads to the following attractive financials. This project will spit out half a billion dollars of EBITDA a year and will come into production in time for the EU and North American ESG-led battery chemicals boom. And compared with Indonesian nickel hydrometallurgical plants, these plants that attempt to offset some of their ESG impediments through spending capital on their tailings and effluent, the tech project capital intensity is actually a lot lower. We have no tailings and effluent to spend capital on. And the nickel costs after byproduct credits are incredibly attractive, representing large and robust margins. And the ore supply, gas supply, Lansdowne Eco Industrial Precinct location land availability, all of that enables a cookie cutter second train plant to be built as a mirror image to the stage one plant and that will benefit from the shared uh, non-process and capital infrastructure that will have already been spent. Here is an update on the project funding. The 2.1 billion project capex supports at least 60% uh, uh, debt. The first thing, of course, that we need to put in place. This is already well advanced and you can see that on the right hand side, $1.4 billion conditionally in place. The debt syndicates independent review is progressing well through their hurdles and even better that debt is primarily through government export credit agencies and they come with attractive tickets. And lastly, we've already got some cornerstone equity in place with more efforts to kick off later this year. But in the non Chinese battery and EV world. All plans come to naught without ESG credentials to match the growing customer demands. Some claim that when push comes to shove, in other words, uh, when nickel and cobalt won't be available from clean suppliers, that ESG credentials don't matter. The experts uh, disagree. You can read the 
the text for yourself, but note the credibility of the sources of these quotes. And I have scores more. And it is already affecting commodity price forecasts and price forecasters scenarios. So your phone, power tool or EV, if you're driving one, here's where your nickel and cobalt is probably coming from today. But in truth, at the moment, ESG does only matter a little. But that's because today no one really knows where the nickel and cobalt is coming from. And that's why Elon Musk described, uh, said the following. He said, ESG is the devil. And he's referring to greenwash and a lack of quantitative measurement in the ESG space. Today, ESG can be the devil, but the devil hates the light and the light is coming tomorrow. And tomorrow, this is what happens. And tomorrow is, say, uh, 2026, just when the tech projects are hitting uh, full production. Here's what tomorrow looks like. Transparent, granular, provenance, and ESG credential reporting and tracking. You look at all of that on the right. All of that is in place or legislated to come into force by 2026. So trans transparent, granular provenance and ESG credential reporting and tracking. And that comes with euro teeth and dollar teeth at their borders. And more powerful than these significant costs to a dirty uh, battery producer, if you're the EV producer, this mandated ESG supply chain um, provenance and impact reporting comes with your customer standing in your showroom scanning the mandated QR code on your EV, showing that the 60 kilograms of nickel in the battery pack in your EV is actually sitting on top of untreated effluent disposed into coral ecosystems and five to six tons of tailings either dumped into the ocean or sitting in high risk tailings dams. If people thought Dieselgate was big, I think the consumer backlash to such an ESG supply chain would be bigger. So let there be ESG light. And with ESG uh, EU legislation in place and blockchain provenance and footprint tracking already underway and developing, the light is nearly here. So commercially attractive projects like the tech project, commercially attractive projects like the tech project are already the beneficiary of this very tomorrow. The ESG game drives EV and battery production outside of China. If you want to supply into North America and you want to supply into the EU, you have to have good ESG credentials. Clearly your project has to be financially attractive and that is the QPM tech project. Thank you very much. Stephen, thank you for the great presentation. We've got lots of questions, so I'll jump into them now. Uh, so will the supply of nickel from Indonesia affect the tech project? Uh, only positively, because that supply of in, uh, nickel from Indonesia is almost exclusively into China. Uh, there have been some announcements of supply potentially into non-Chinese markets. So a recent example would be the announced Ford Vale Huayu high pressure acid leach project. If you look at the capital intensity of that project, because Ford and Vale are very credible and, and respectable companies and they have to tell the truth, of course. But if you look at the capital intensity of that project, it's 40% higher than the tech project. So if you want to deal with Indonesian uh, conditions, that's what you have to spend. Furthermore, the nickel equivalent grade of the ore that we supply, uh, you take into account the byproduct credits, you know, we have 1.6% nickel, 0.18% cobalt. Indonesia is typically about 1.1 and 0.1. Look at the nickel equivalent grade. Our grade is nearly 60% higher. Grade is king, and we win on that front too. So no, um, the world needs every nickel project that's out there. You've already seen some in this broker briefing. You know, all powered, all nickel projects. It is the most at risk of the battery supply chain. Thanks, Stephen. Bear with me. I'm jumping around a bit here. So uh, it was referenced that procurement and construction was, com was to commence in February and July, respectively. Has there been an, a revised timeline for these events? 
Um, we're going through all of that with our debt providers at the moment, seeking uh, uh, financial close with the debt providers uh, late this year. We're already designing early works that we hope to commence uh, later this year. Okay, next one. So when do you expect the gas supply deal to be executed? Um, not sure what I can say. Very, very short time. Uh, it's just uh, going through minor administrative stuff at the moment, but watch this space. Probably another one we can't get to now, but so when is the DFS and the final investment decision uh, expected? So the feasibility study was completed uh, last year, but with the debt providers, uh, they're requiring an additional material beyond the conventional feasibility study. And uh, we're working with all of our uh, key equipment and technology suppliers to secure performance guarantees as well. So we're going effectively above above and beyond. And obviously, you've got to refresh the capital because uh, some of the heat has come out of the capital market, which is nice. Nice to have some wind blowing in the right direction and uh, doing more detailed design so that we can accelerate through the construction. So later this year. Next one. So how does the decrease in nickel and cobalt spot prices affect the financial feasibility of the tech project? Uh, anyone who runs projects based upon spot prices is already in a loser or winner game, depending upon how the spot's going at the moment. What counts is the long-term supply price. Uh, and you know the projections there are massive deficits in nickel coming later this decade, perfect timing for us. Cobalt's very hard to predict. It depends upon what happens in the DRC. DRC is 70% of the world's cobalt. They have an Ebola outbreak or another civil war or government intervention. Uh, cobalt will go ballistic. If not, there will be adequate cobalt supply. But importantly for us, <clears throat> we are naturally hedged. Our ore supply is linked to the nickel price. So the nickel price comes off uh, or gets cheaper and ore is our equal biggest cost. So we're partially naturally hedged there. So we're not too too fussed, then nickel forecasts look extremely attractive. Thank you, Stephen. And I think just finally, just to reiterate to shareholders and investors, what should they be looking forward to over the next, say, three to six months? Um, certainly the gas supply and all the gas implications. Uh, you know, some people might have noticed a, a minor bullet point in there. We become the sixth biggest domestic gas producer in Australia, and I think the third biggest one on the east coast of Australia. Uh, there is a lot of gas there, um, and that gas, you know, the excess to what our needs are, uh, goes into the spot or peaking power market. So that's a very, very financially attractive. The synergies with the tech project are fantastic because, you know, these plants, uh, they're big plants, they don't run all the time. So 90% availability, 10% of the time, you're not running and consuming the gas. Guess what? You need somewhere else for that gas to go. We've got it. So certainly a lot of gas developments, uh, finalizing uh, capital refresh, uh, securing uh, agreements with all of our uh, key equipment and technology suppliers for uh, performance guarantees um, and uh, just packaging all that up uh, for uh, the financial close by the end of the year. Wonderful. Well, Stephen, thank you for the great presentation. We look forward to further updates. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.